There might be a dozen or so people on the internet who haven't heard about the Covington MAGA kids. Just in case you are one of them, let's recap. Social media and news outlets have been exploding with commentary about a group of high school kids who interacted with a couple of groups of protesters while in Washington, D.C. for the March for Life. Some of these kids, students from a Catholic school, were wearing MAGA hats. And one of them in particular, named Nick Sandman, has become the focus of intense bursts of rhetoric and more than a few reprehensible statements on social media. Was this incident worthy of all this vitriol? Well, it's time for some roasted opinions. I learned from many of the posts on social media this week that a smirk is a sure sign of white supremacy. Naturally, since I don't want to be mistaken for a white supremacist, I have decided to add smirking to the list of things which I no longer do. Drinking milk, giving the okay hand sign, and sharing Pepe memes. Oh, and wearing MAGA hats, too, because everybody knows that these hats are racist. There's a lot to unpack here, obviously. Let's take a look at why there are so many new symbols of racism and white supremacy. To do that, we will have to look back to a certain presidential campaign and a certain presidential candidate. No, not Trump. Hillary. Does anyone remember this gem? No, you can just be grossly. No, you can put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. <laughs> Homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. And unfortunately, there are people like that. And he has lifted them up. Let's note something here. Former Secretary Clinton rated fully half of the supporters of Donald Trump as racist, sexist, homophobic, etc., and she blamed Donald Trump for lifting them up. The message was that Trump is deplorable and so are at least half of the people who support him. That moment right there, that's the launch of the ism and phobic narrative. That's when the nation started looking at their neighbors as horrible people because they disagree on politics. That's when everyone who holds politically conservative beliefs suddenly became a horrible racist, a misogynist, a sexist, a homophobe, a transphobe, a xenophobe, an Islamophobe. Heck, less than three years later, just slap either ist or phobe onto any identifying characteristic and you can be sure that somebody, somewhere, is probably accusing someone else of that deplorable title they just invented. Trump's campaign slogan was, Make America Great Again. Like any candidate, he put that slogan on signs, on shirts, on practically everything, including on baseball caps, thus creating the MAGA hat. Naturally, since the media picked up on the deplorable narrative, the hats themselves have become a symbol of deplorable status. Wearing one advertises how deplorable the wearer is, and the far left, in particular, is triggered every time that they see one. There was another narrative, too. Having been caught specifically interfering with the electoral process in the Democrat Party, Hillary's campaign started the Russian collusion narrative. It was Russia that tanked her chances, not the fact that she dismissed a huge portion of the electorate as deplorable people. Not that she repeatedly displayed behavior that made her look senile or in poor health, and not the decades-long trail of rumors that she was a corrupt politician. Not at all. Nope. Nothing to see here. Hillary's fine. The far left picked up the Russian collusion narrative, too, and they ran with it. We've been living with years of the Mueller investigation ever since. But who cares, right? It's just the far left, except that the narrative was broadcast Globally, the Speaker of the House of Commons in the UK Parliament, John Burkow, notably broke protocol in his haste to declare the President persona non grata in Parliament and had to apologize for it. Every time that Trump attempts to negotiate with any other foreign leader, he has to fight uphill against calls to reject the meeting directed towards the leaders of other nations. God forbid that the President meets with Vladimir Putin because that's certainly a sign that he is still colluding with him. Every time that he tries to address domestic problems that the United States legitimately faces, the taint of Trump's reputed deplorability is the story. 
I know this because it is broadcast by news services and splashed across social media. I have friends who are actually afraid that Trump will harm them. I know people who believe that he is a fascist, and so is everyone else who supports him. Um, no. Just, no. Now, bearing in mind those narratives, let's look again at the Covington MAGA kids. They were on a trip to participate in the March for Life, which makes sense because they attend a Catholic school. Catholicism considers abortion to be one of the worst ills to plague the world. Kids attending a Catholic school are likely to be Catholics. And it makes sense that there would be a large group of pro-life kids at a Catholic school who wish to attend a pro-life march. Some of those kids wore MAGA hats, showing their support for Donald Trump. Again, this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, as Trump is a pro-life politician from the party which supports the pro-life movement. He would have had supporters in that group of kids, and some of them would wear their MAGA hats proudly. They may have even hoped to see President Trump and get their hats signed. While waiting for their bus to pick them up, they happened to stand close to a group of men from the Black Hebrew Israelite Movement. The Southern Poverty Law Center and the Anti-Defamation League have both noted that this movement contains some expressly racist and homophobic people, and from the video evidence of the incident, the gentlemen from this movement who encountered the Covington kids were of this persuasion. They began to hurl insults of a racist, homophobic, and particularly foul nature towards the group of students. The students responded to these insults by performing several chants such as one might hear at a pep rally or a school athletic event. Their chants weren't offensive, and they didn't try to engage directly with the men who were insulting them. From what I saw, they were merely trying to keep their spirits up and drown out the bile being spewed at them. Now, it just so happened that the Indigenous People's March was held at one end of the National Mall on the same day that the March for Life was held at the other end of the mall. And wouldn't you know it, a group of Indigenous people were in the area at the time. One, Nathan Phillips, approached the group of students while beating on a drum and chanting. Now, before we go any further, let's be clear. My understanding is that Mr. Phillips was praying. I'm not a Native American, and I do not pretend to speak the language that Mr. Phillips was chanting, nor do I pretend that I understand exactly his religious beliefs and practices. I am familiar enough with American indigenous tribes in general to say that the statement that he was praying is a completely credible statement. I have no evidence which refutes that assertion by Mr. Phillips. I therefore accept that he was praying or otherwise practicing his faith. According to the video evidence, though, Mr. Phillips was praying face-to-face -face with Nick Sandman. Mr. Sandman's expression was, to my eyes, bemused, as in uncomfortable and confused. Sandman looks as if he is smirking to some, but to me he looks as if he is grimacing slightly in discomfort. His statements during an interview reflect this discomfort and confusion. Try to put on his shoes. Nick Sandman was a member of a group which had received verbal abuse and now had an elderly indigenous man in his face drumming and chanting. This experience would have been outside normal for most people, and teenagers don't always know how to react to weird experiences. Some back up at the first sign of weirdness, and some refuse to back off even when they perhaps should. The group of kids was exercising their right to stay put while they waited for the school bus to come pick them up. Nick Salmon was standing in place, neither approaching nor backing down as Nathan Ph Phillips prayed directly in his face. What should we believe? What was reported at first, or what was reported since then? Is a smirk really a sign of racism? When faced with a situation like this, I default to looking for the lies. People tend to lie when they think that they need to recast their behavior in a different light. Maybe Mr. Phillips remembers things the way that he said that they happened, but I have to note that the kids reported the incident fairly accurately when compared to the full video, and Mr. Phillips' story doesn't match. Neither does the edited video used as the basis for the reporting which followed, in which Sandman and his fellow students were cast as smirking racists in MAGA hats. The complete video supports their telling of the events, so much so that lawsuits are being filed by the families of some of these kids against media outlets which stirred up a hate mob against their kids with their bad reporting, and against people who directly or indirectly threaten the kids and their school with harm on social media. The school has subsequently faced having their website hacked and has had to cancel classes on at least one day over concerns for the safety and security for the kids. In the America I grew up in, this was not considered acceptable behavior towards children or towards schools, which are supposed to be a safe place. Oh, 
And about the MAGA hats, I suggest that those who think that school kids should not wear clothing that makes political statements should look up Tinker v. Des Moines Independent Community School District, 393 U.S. 503, 1969. The U.S. Supreme Court decided long ago that school kids enjoy First Amendment rights and that the school, quote, must be able to show that their action was caused by something more than a mere desire to avoid the discomfort and unpleasantness that always accompanies an unpopular viewpoint, that the conduct would materially and substantially interfere with the requirements of appropriate discipline in the operation of the school, unquote. In other words, under the Tinker Doctrine, the MAGA hats have to be proven to be a significant disruption or potentially a significant disruption for the school officials to require for them to be removed. Subsequent cases on this matter reiterate that the schools do have the authority to block disruptive or potentially disruptive actions by students, but the Tinker precedent sets a high hurdle for what's disruptive. And honestly... If you are uncomfortable with a hat that features a slogan from a sitting president's successful campaign, that's just not enough. There's nothing expressly racist with the phrase, Make America Great Again. The only racism imputed to that phrase was implied back in the 2016 campaign. Racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. Now that's just my opinion. Comment below to share yours. If you like this video, check out my playlist. Check out these channels I have subscribed for more great content. New episodes are coming, so subscribe and ring the bell.